Uh, is the dating scene as bad as people make it out to be? I think it actually is. And I hate to say that, but I do. I think it, it's it's terrible. <laughs> I think I think that <laughs> for a couple of reasons, I think there's more access to people, obviously, like with social media, with dating apps. It's just easier to come across more options compared to like, I don't know, maybe even 30 years ago, there wasn't as much access to people. So if you didn't come in contact with these people or you weren't introduced through a mutual acquaintance, it was unlikely that you were gonna be meeting people from around the world. Like I can meet someone that lives in Thailand online if I want, like the, it's just easier to find people. And then I think too, people don't talk about this one as much. People are communicating more but they haven't improved their communication skills. So I think that misunderstanding is happening more frequently, which doesn't fare well in a dating market where you have more access to more options. So if we get into an argument about something, I have very little incentive to work that out with you if I feel like I have other options readily available and open to me. Like there's no, there's very little incentive to just work through issues. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, because I heard someone say the other day that they have to uh, they have to compare themselves to somebody in another country opposed to the person that they met down the street. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's just there's so many options now. It's like, I mean, and not even just like, OK, women getting DMs and stuff like that. But like if if I want to seek out someone or I can be like how you were watching a YouTube video. And if I like what the person is saying, I can reach out to that person and then, you know, start a conversation from there. It's just easier to meet people now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, too, you probably don't have to, like you say, put in, I guess, as much work. Um, I guess I'm telling my age, you know, we, <laughs> we used to have to take our little uh, pen and our paper or whatever and go actually <laughs> walk up to a girl, you know, so I, yeah. Right, or your phone had a cord on it. So if, we, if we're not talking in person, then I'm in the house. Talk. Like you're only able to talk to me like that if I'm in the house, like you didn't have a cell phone and you just can call people at any time of the day or like you're, there's no constant contact like that unless y'all spent all day together in person or, or in the house on the phone. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people are, are more accessible today, which is, it's a good thing, but it's it's a bad thing. I guess you gotta take the good with the bad, I guess, right? Right, yeah, yeah. trade-offs. Yeah, because I remember back in the day when we used to talk to girls, uh, we used to have to get through the first line of defense and that was their mama or their daddy. You know, can I speak to, can I speak to Kiana? Who is this? <laughs> but that's the other thing too. I think there's not a lot of vetting going on in that way. So, whereas I think traditionally and in other cultures, the family has more of a influence on what dating looks like. I think now it's kind of just like every man for themselves, you know, and then women are not necessarily picking the best options all the time for them. And not even just talking about money and stuff like that, but just in terms of character or a good fit, um, similar trajectory or outlook on goals and things like that. I think that's not happening as much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that makes the dating pool a little, a little murky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Because I posted a video the other day, had people upset. I was talking about settling. And I like that they do not like that, <laughs> particularly the men do not like that word. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I was I'm, I'm I'm not I don't know if you're uh, similar with with my story or not, but I met my wife on Instagram. Well, I've been through a divorce. Right, I was married for 15 years, went through a divorce. I met my wife on Instagram, and uh, we married in six months. I relocated a year later, and we coming up on five years of marriage this month on the 27th. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Thank you. So just like that, I was like, look, I was telling people 80 percent. She had 80 percent of what I was looking right. for in a woman. Yeah. And I was like, let's go. I wasn't trying to have her on the side and then yeah. try to chase 90 percent. You know what I'm saying? I 
have a question. Can I ask a question? I don't want to hijack no. what you got going on, but I do have a question. Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I've heard, I, it, it seems like it goes in one of two ways. Once men have been married and then they're back into the dating market, either they get married very quickly afterwards, they meet someone and they're like, okay, I, I, like this is it. Or they're very hesitant after that divorce. And it's like, I don't know if I wanna be married anymore. I don't know if I can do this. So how, what do you think? What do you think makes the difference between those two scenarios and how men react? Is it just the man or is it something else? Great question. I think a lot of it has to do with the man and how the marriage possibly ended mm. I, I think that because some guys you got some guys on one end of the spectrum like you say but they they probably have some bitterness or some resentment and the divorce was all about their spouse right mm -hmm. it was like everything that she'd done wrong mm -hmm. it had nothing to do with them you know so in my in my case i believe i healed faster because i was able to admit where I went wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was like premature. I married when I was 24, heavy in the church, that whole thing. Um, I just, I just wasn't mature enough. Like, mm -hmm. you know. but I think a lot of it has to do with the heart condition. Either they got a lot of bitterness and they like, I'm through with women. I'm just going to run through women because I'm hurting. Or you're going to have some man that's like, I, I learned my lesson from the first marriage and I think I got it right this time around. So I know I know what I'm looking for. I'm more mature. I'm more secure in myself. Then I can move forward. Mm, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on the man, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, can you discuss in detail the five phrases we can use after an argument? Because I've seen this on your Instagram post and I was like, Yes, let's talk about this because very few people know how to diffuse an argument in a healthy way. They just stop talking and they're, they're done. Yeah, so I got that concept from um, some friends of mine. Mm -hmm. They're uh, Aaron and Jocelyn Freeman. They're a couple that coaches other couples. And so they have this term that they talk about. It's called the argument hangover. And so it's the period of time between when a, a, an argument takes place and then when you're able to get back on track. And so they have like a whole book and everything that talks about like how to decrease that argument hangover period. And so when I created that post, it was like, like you said, a lot of times it's kind of awkward. And then it's like, okay, well, who's going to talk first? Who's going to apologize first? Well, how are we going to get back on track? And y'all are kind of like moving around each other hesitantly and like, okay, what are we going to do? And so I was trying to think about ways, and these are actually things that I say or use within my own relationship. And so like the first one is like, just, I love you. Because sometimes after an argument, especially women, I don't know that men experience this as much, but women for sure, we just want to know that you still are, are here with us. Like you're still in it, even though it was a bad time, a bad moment, like you're still committed, you're still in it, you still care about us no matter what just took place so a lot of times that can help and it sounds very simple but like just saying that even sometimes in the midst of an argument if you pause and say like i just want to say i love you like i just want to take a moment here and just say i love you or say like can we can we hug for a minute like can mm -hmm. we just like hug each other i think it helps to kind of bring the energy down sometimes um and then the other another one was like what could i have done better in this situation so a lot of those different ones were how can we prevent this from happening moving forward and so when you ask questions like what could i have done better in the situation it shows the other person that you care about how they felt and it opens up the 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 door for them to be able to communicate what they needed in the conversation a lot of times when arguments or disagreements happen a lot of times from what I've seen, it's that one or both parties are feeling misunderstood, undervalued, or underappreciated. And so in helping to kind of bridge the gap of making you feel appreciated, I think that can diffuse a lot of arguments. Um, moving on, like, how can we prevent this from happening in the future? How did my actions make you feel? 
And then like, what is another way that I could have communicated that would have helped you to better receive what I was trying to say? I love that one. Like that is my favorite one <laughs> because I think a lot of times we talk about things like love languages and things yes. like that, but we don't necessarily talk about communication languages or apology languages. Mm. And those are things that if I say that I'm invested in you within this relationship, the onus is on me to understand how I can speak to you in ways that you're going to best receive what I have to say to you. I think a lot of times people come into situations and they're, um, they have this attitude and kind of like a chip on their shoulder, like, well, they need to just, they need to accept me for who I am. But I argue that relationships require on the job training. So you end up having to learn what your partner needs in order for them again to feel valued, appreciated, respected, um, cherished, like all of those good things that we all wanna feel. Mm -hmm. You have to figure out, okay, moving forward, how, if this situation comes up again, how can I tailor my approach so that you're able to receive what I'm saying. Because if I care about you in this relationship, it's not just about me getting off my chest what I want to get off my chest. If I want us to grow together, I have to make sure that you're able to receive what I'm saying or it's no point in me speaking. Mm. I love that. Yeah, because defensiveness is a killer, right? It is. And, you know, going off of that, which it's a slight sidestep, but... I find a lot of times because I'm not a part of the manosphere, but I'm I'm like I'm, I'm, I'm I don't know, but I'm not a part of them. But a lot of times you hear people talk about that women have this tendency to revert to sign language, like they say, like shame, insults, guilt, the need to be right. Mm. That is a phrase that is co-opted from. If you ever went to therapy, they talk about the five horse or the four horsemen of communication. Mm -hmm. They just reframed it and then put it on women. But in in just in general, these are the four things that happen across men and women that hinder communication. So when we talk about like stonewalling or defensiveness, mm -hmm. like you said, mm -hmm. those are like deflecting, like those kinds of things just don't fare well in communication and in conversation, regardless, men or women, we all have the tendency to do it when we're feeling like the other person is not understanding or listening to us. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree. Just to let you know that um, with, with the, the platform that I have, I'm an equal opportunity employer. Oh, men and women can get it if you out of line you just out of line <laughs> i like that <laughs> yeah, you know what i'm saying i'm i'm not you know pro and for, like if you wrong you're just wrong same yeah that's how i approach it too unfortunately i do think that sometimes people conflate someone not agreeing with something with them not taking accountability for something like mm -hmm. i can disagree with you and still respect your opinion. Like just because I disagree with you doesn't mean that I'm trying to evade responsibility or not take accountability. There is a such thing as me just not agreeing with your stance and your opinion because at the end of the day, it's an opinion and it's based off of your experiences, which you've been exposed to and, and mine is the same for me, which are not necessarily the same things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because sometimes you lose people in that turn. Just because we disagree, it's like, you know, people are, uh, unfriend you, unfollow you or whatever. You just be like, we just like, had a disagreement. People are not, from what I'm seeing, they're not used to having disagreements or misunderstandings and still having some sort of like amicable resolution. It's like, if we disagree, then it's going to get nasty. It's going to go left. We're going to have to block each other afterwards. And there is a such thing as healthy conflict that I think people are just not used to. But I think part of it is a lack of communication skills. And then the other part is a lack of maturity because, and then like some of it is ego and pride too, because I, I shouldn't be so wrapped up in my opinion that it offends me if, if other people disagree with me. Mm -hmm. I think that's unhealthy because if I'm that wrapped up in that opinion, I'm probably going to also reject any new information that disputes what I thought. And you can't, like, I think it's 
there it's good to be a lifelong learner where you're not so tied to your opinions or you allow your opinions to morph and grow or evolve as you do mm -hmm. and i think that's how you just i think that's how you evolve just as a person yeah no i agree some of the the, the world's greatest authors they'll say, do you still have the same, they would be interviewed and they say, do you still have the same belief system that you wrote in this book in 1998? They're like, no. <laughs> it changed. I got exposed to new information and it changed and that's healthy. Yeah, right. And sold millions of copies, but I don't even think like that anymore. Yeah, like it was a good perspective at the time. It made sense at the time. I had support for it at the time, but you know, I changed, I got new information. I you know, it, it's, it's different now. Mm. That's healthy. That's fine. I agree. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm a big fan of just, I, you know, after 45 years of life, I realized I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm so, so much to learn. All so the time. much to learn. Yeah. I get some stuff from the old heads. I get some stuff from the, from the youngins, you know, it's just a, hey, you know, just lifelong learner. Yeah. Hmm. I believe great relationships aren't found, but they are built. How do you build great relationships? So I think that any relationship can be judged off of how much trust is present. I think the best relationships have the most trust. And I think probably the worst relationships have the least amount of trust. And so I think building a foundation of trust is really important. I heard somebody say something once and they were like, you don't fall in love, you grow in love. And so I think that when you're able to trust someone, it allows you to connect in different ways that that help intertwine your lives. I read something, mm -hmm. um, and it was an article once and it was saying how when we talk about love, it the parts of your brain that are affected by the feelings of love are the same parts that are affected when you're addicted to like a drug or something. Mm -hmm. And so quite literally love, is, that feeling of love is an addiction to the feeling of, you know, associated with whatever that, that person or that thing or whatever. And so I think that with that in mind, you have to have something that for lack of a better term, nurtures the addiction. So whether that is, you know, time that you're spending together, goals that you're spending, I mean, sharing with each other. When we talk about like the levels of intimacy, I think that it's important that a lot of times we focus on the things that are easiest. So like sex or like spending time with each other, but there are there is an, a level of intimacy that is simply sharing goals, sharing experiences with each other. And then I think when you have a vested interest in what the other person is doing, where they're going, and you're able to support them in that way, I think that that helps to build on whatever love is already present. Does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and then there was something that I wanted to kind of double back on because you said love isn't, you said love isn't you don't fall in love, but you grow in love. Grow. Yeah. How, how do you feel about that? I think that, I think that that's, I think that there's some truth to that because love is not just a feeling. I think love is embodied in action. Mm -hmm. So I think that you have to make a choice that that's what you're going to do. So even if, even if I don't like you today, like you made me upset today, if I love you, then I have to make a choice to still respect you, to still be committed to you, to still, you know, just mm -hmm. treat you in the way that you deserve to be treated. So when I think about growing in love with someone, I think when you say I'm falling in love with someone, I think it takes away that part, that choice part. It's like, it just happened to me. I fell and it's just happening. And then if I fall out, then that might just happen. I might just fall out one day. I think that if you say I'm growing in love with you, then that is more intentional. Like that implies that I'm making a choice to be here. I'm making a choice to grow with you rather than away from you. I'm making a choice to choose you. Mm. And then in doing that, we're able to grow together. And I think that going back to the trust thing, I think that's what builds trust is knowing that I'm gonna stick through this. 
I'm going to be committed to bettering my communication with you. I'm going to be committed to choosing you in times where it's hard for me to choose you or when in times where it's hard for me to even choose myself. Like, mm. I think that that allows that to happen. Mm -hmm. No, I agree because um, there are some things with arranged marriages too. I think statistically arranged marriages last longer than people we actually choose. Yeah. And I have this belief as well that I think when two people want, I think if two people can share the same morals and values and just overall trajectory for what they want in their lives, I think if they are committed to making that work, I think virtually any two people where that is the case can work out. I think things like I think things like attraction can grow. I don't know that it's the same for men as women. I know women can grow in attraction to men. Men don't necessarily like to hear that, I don't think, but it can, like, especially people that are more intellectual and are, and that are attracted to intelligent men, then for sure that can grow. I mean, the same way, like someone that cares for you, that treats you well, it's hard not to, have some feelings of affection for that person mm -hmm. so i think if you put two people in a scenario i've always wanted to try this on my i have this desire to create a show out of this where i put two people that i have found to be compatible mm -hmm. isolate them in a scenario where they are like in an apartment or something for two to three weeks and then giving them exercises to help them build connection and identify goals and stuff i have a belief that they would choose each other and know quick enough or quicker than most people that they would want to get married to each other i think mm -hmm. that a lot of the outside influences and things that like social media and family influence and you know advice from people that have nothing to do with the situation mm -hmm. um, make this whole dating thing much more difficult Mm. So it's the outside, it's the outside voices that that can kind of deter you or uh, maybe bad programming from the way you grew up, you know, um, nobody falls in love that fast or, you know, they're all yeah. you know, or and to some extent i think men are a bit they're shamed a bit when it comes to wanting to settle down i think there's this whole like sowing your oats and you know there's like you need to live your life and you need to see what's out there those kinds of terms i think make men even if they find someone that they really like or that they really can see a future with it makes them second guess and be like well hold on but it's too early or I don't, you know, maybe this isn't the right one or maybe there's someone better out there that would be, you know, like you said, your wife was 80% of what you wanted. Maybe there's someone that's 85% or, you know, we've heard it. They become so fixated on that 20% that they're missing that then when they come across someone who only has the 20%, they're like, well, that's what I've been missing, but <laughs> not realizing that the 80% is not in this person. So I think that I think that if we are more intentional about changing the way that we talk about marriage and about creating a union with one person, I think that it could produce different outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree because I was talking to my wife the other day about the, the video that I posted about uh, settling. And I was like, I just think we live in a culture where, and I'm about to use an old school term that we rarely use. But for those who listen, and it's a word called content. Mm. And, and again, I think we look at content as a bad thing. You know, it's like, no, I'm not settling. You got, you know, people out here never settle. And I, I get it. Totally understand. <laughs> I don't knock that. But think about this, Kiana. We live in a culture where, including me, right? I have way more shoes than I need. Mm -hmm. I have a closet full of, and, and I'm not bragging. I'm just, I'm just grateful. Yeah. Right? But I have more than I need. I have enough stuff to give to three or four different people. Mm -hmm. Honestly, at the root of that, that's just me being greedy. Mm -hmm. For me, you know. Yeah. I got more. A, a pair of Jordans drop. I already got four pair. Why would I need to get another pair? Yeah. Just because I just got to get the drop. I just, you know what I'm saying? So I think we look at people as a commodity too. Mm -hmm. where we look at people last, I gotta have more. 
this person isn't enough for me. And with social media, we see so much, we have so much exposure that is like, it, it makes that itch that much more uh, 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 insatiable. We just gotta keep, you know, scratching that itch because there could possibly can be somebody else. And if you think about all the, the newness that come with meeting someone, yeah you know people who might be serial daters and no shade to serial daters you know but it's just that newness that euphoria of being with somebody new you know so i just think we don't i just don't think we think settling or being content is a is a word that we don't like hearing today yeah i think in general we have a culture of excess like excess everything just excess sugar in our food excess yeah. like everything just too much of everything that we don't really need and i think that i think i don't know why people have that issue with the settling conversation because in essence i mean anybody could say that they they are settling like you're always gonna there is always the potential that there is greater out there but I think at some point we have to get to a point where we say, maybe this isn't everything, but it's enough. And that's not to slight the choice that you make, like to say like, okay, it was good enough, but it met all of the, the most, the highest priority requirements that I had. And so I understood that maybe some of those things that I'm asking for are not that important, but this person met the highest level things and that's what i try to talk to people about i think men have a harder they have a harder time understanding that similar to how men have a like a whole list of things that they would like like you would like the woman that has like the tiny waist and the big booty and like like this nice shape and these perfect teeth perfect skin like beautiful flowing hair like you would want those things too. Like she cooks like Gordon Ramsay and she, you know, cleans and she's perfect. Y'all want that women want a man that is a certain height and makes this money. And like, we both have these preferences that we want, but then we come to a place where we say, okay, but which of these things is not going to impact my legacy or which of these things is not important when it comes to raising children or is not important in terms of helping me, helping support me in the ways that I need to be supported. And then you find somebody who is in alignment with that. And maybe some of those things will pair up with items on your list that you wanted, but then a lot of them aren't, and they're probably not that important anyway. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Because, uh, yeah, because everybody wanted all. Like Oprah, yeah. Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey said, you can have it all, just not at one time. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, so uh, again, the 80%, I, I'm, I'm good. I, let me prioritize what's important to me. Somebody who's gonna speak life to me, someone who's gonna be there for me, you know, all those different things. Now, and I tell people, I married the baddest chick in the game and I'm only 5'8". I know that's, see, it's not about height. It's not about height. I think people are convinced that women, literally they say this, women don't see men below six feet. And I'm like, y'all are crazy. You like, there. yes, there are some women that won't give you the time of day. Yes, they are. But you probably didn't want them anyway, because if they're prioritizing height in that way, that there are some other things tied to that that wouldn't have fared well in a relationship with you. Yep. So, but there are plenty of, because I said this the other day, there are a whole host of women that are like 5'2", 5'1", 5'3". More often than not, I hear women say they want someone taller than them. Yeah. There are some women that don't care and they'll date men shorter than them. Mm -hmm. But the average height of a woman, I think, is 5'4", or 5'5". Mm -hmm. Yeah. So most men are not that short. Mm -hmm. You got some shorties out there, but you do. But yeah. there, most men are not five five. Yeah, <laughs> but I think the average height of a man is maybe five seven, five eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. um, it, it, and, and there is some truth to the whole height game because even statistically, I've seen a study that was done when uh, people are hiring people for um, businesses are hiring people for upper management or CEOs of companies ideally they they qualify the person who's taller mm. 
Mm -hmm. You know, so if somebody's 5'10 and somebody's 6'2, that 6'2 person has a better chance of getting that position than the guy that's that's 5'10. Mm -hmm. But that's why I say too, like, I think that in those instances for men, because I think men can feel a little hopeless in that regard because height isn't something that you can change. I think that it helps you if you focus on the other things that women find important that you can control. Mm -hmm. So like women do not only just care about how much money you make and how tall you are. The, the, the ability to communicate gets a lot of women. Like if you can be an effective communicator, if you are able to talk to them in, in ways that, that other men can't or don't, like women do pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that women find valuable in men that I don't think men put a lot of stock in. And I think that that's also a problem when it comes to dating, just because I think it it does make men feel a little hopeless that mm -hmm. the things that women care about, I, I don't have. So I don't make that much money. I don't, I'm not that tall. Like I, and, and that's, there's, it's not over for you, King. Yeah. If that's the case. It's not over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, because I've seen some short guys kill the game. I've yeah. seen guys five, 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 six, and I'm just like, you know. And they're probably very charismatic and probably have great personalities and probably are very good with their they're, they're very smooth talkers, yep. probably. <laughs> yeah. Because women care about that. Yep. And I think there's a certain demographic when you talk about the things that women are looking for. I think there's a certain demographic because uh, and I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and shows and people talk about, you know, requirements and all these different things. And like you said, I think it's a certain demographic. Um, so what you're looking for, if, if they're in that demographic, then chances are, sorry, you know. Exactly. But... I think as you get older and you mature, you realize what's what's really important. Like you say about legacy and all those things. Cause, and I tell people all the time, you gonna all, there's just cause you get married, there's always gonna be fine women. There's always gonna be fine men. Like it don't stop. It's just a matter of you valuing the person that you're with. Yeah, cause I have like when I'm in a relationship, I have like tunnel vision. Like I don't even see, I don't even see men. Like I can. I'll just be walking straight forward. I don't even see y'all. But I think that, you know, if you're if you're wanting to go out and and explore options, then you're going to find options that seem better. And I think it all is like an intention. And then being intentional about what positions you're putting yourself in as well. Mm -hmm. I think if two people spend enough time around each other and speak about things that are important and deep and connect with each other, virtually any two people can become attracted to each other. Mm -hmm. So I think if you know that you're in a situation where you're wanting to be committed to someone, you have to mind your time and you have to put systems in place that don't allow for love, as we say, to grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a whole show within itself. <laughs> yeah, because I watched the whole four hours with you on um we need to talk i you know i was at work but i <laughs> did you watch it like consecutively or did you have to break it up no you know what i broke it up you know what i broke it up in two hours okay i watched two hours one day and then i watched the... i think long so what were your thoughts when you watched it Ooh, i don't know if alan gonna watch this video or not i don't know i don't know him personally he but great <laughs> great guy i i mean i love his content great guy but I I think it was a great show. I think it was a great mm -hmm. conversation. So much stuff that both of you talked about that I wanted to jump in so bad and was like, hold on, I want to just say this real quick. Like, I was so upset that I missed it. It was a great conversation. Um, I just think, I think, I don't know if he's speaking on behalf of men or if he's speaking on behalf of his experience and who he Inter who he interacts with I don't know mm -hmm. but um, for me and I think maybe I'm speaking from an older demographic that you know some of the things I just disagree with 
you know i just think men i think for men i hold men in a higher regard as far as trying to find the right woman and all this other stuff mm-hmm. I, I i put men in a higher regard because they i'm like if you're going to be a leader lead mm-hmm. like get you together you talk about you you know all oh, women want a man but they, okay well go get it and i will agree with alan like you said men are pick me's 100 <laughs> true <laughs> like the things that men do we very few men do things for them uh-huh uh women say they love beards <laughs> and here you are <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm saying I, you know so it's it's one of those things and i do think and i'm gonna ask you this question later i don't know if i should ask you now you know what let me ask you this now since we're here um, well, well, first of all, how did you feel about the whole conversation? Because to converse for four hours is phenomenal. I could do the same thing, but it's a long time. Yes, yeah, um, I think for me, it was it was a couple things. Mm. Um, so afterwards, me and Alan had a conversation, and he was like, "I think that me and you were kind of missing each other in different parts of the conversation." I, and I was that. like. I agree. I seen. That. I think which this is no like no shade to of Alan. At all. We're just talking. But when I speak to Alan one on one, I think our my experience with him is different than when I speak to him on camera. Mm-hmm. I think that, and it's understandable. I'm not gonna say that he tailors his message depending on the audience, mm-hmm. but I think that he understands. Alan gets a lot of flack in times, any time that he agrees with me. Like if you go yeah. through the comments, you'll see like, I don't know, like they, if he agrees with me on anything, then he's trying to pander to women. Mm-hmm. It's not that maybe my, what I said had substance, it's that he wants to pander to women or he likes me or because I'm an attractive women, mm-hmm. woman that he has this obligation to it like impress me or something like that. So on one hand, they discredit me and my mm-hmm. thoughts and my Same opinion. Comments. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other part of it is, um, I mean, and similarly, like I was saying earlier, if I disagree with anything that Alan says, I'm not taking accountability for women. Mm-hmm. It's not that I just simply disagree. I'm not taking accountability, even though I agree with a lot of things that he says and Like you said, I'm an equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I will point out places where women are doing or could do better and are not meeting what I think the expectation needs to be. And similar with men, I don't really let them off either. So, but I think the problem is, like I was saying earlier, there's a lot more communication happening. So you now have this manosphere, this Mm -hmm. place where men are able to exercise and voice all of these issues that they've had for all of these years and unfortunately I think a lot of men are latching onto that and then regurgitating these same points without doing any personal research without it's literally they say the exact same thing so you know that it didn't originate with them so I think that if you say anything that is dissenting from that, then they get upset about it. Mm-hmm. And when they get upset, they get real upset, like yeah. real yeah. mad. Um, but I think that that was the thing too, was just like, I think it's it's hard. It's hard, first of all, it's hard to have a conversation when it's live because people are watching it and people are like sending in comments and stuff like that. And, yeah. and like, you know, they, everybody has an opinion, which is understandable, but they, at the same time, I just think that people, people unfortunately are quick to make judgments on a person based on how much they agree with them. Mm-hmm. And that's not, I don't think that's necessarily the best way to go about judging, um, if a person is genuine or if a person is intelligent or if you know like i can disagree with you and you can still be a very intelligent person we just don't see the world in similar ways Mm -hmm. and and i I get it to a degree because you have to i won't say you have to but sometimes having the uh yin and the yang or having the disagreements it's it's almost like for ratings to a degree right Um, yeah you know you get more people to watch that so i think some people might struggle with I'm not saying this is Alan. I'm just generalizing. I think some people struggle with uh, 
can I be my authentic self? See, because, uh, see, because I'm getting ahead of myself and I want to talk to you about this. <laughs> <clears throat> Since we're here, I'm, I'm going to talk about it. Um, people, you know what? Let me ask you the question. Go ahead. About it. Um, because what stuck, what stood out to me was the on the episode of We Need to Talk when you talked about healthy Black marriages. Mm-hmm. And you talked about we need to see more of that. But my question to you is, how can we promote healthy Black marriages when they aren't getting the proper exposure? So I think kind of like what I was saying in the conversation with me and Alan, I think that one, I think our community doesn't take on the full power that we have. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's very, it's, I don't think it's an outlandish idea to believe that if we wanted to, we could elect representatives that spoke for us Mm -hmm. and like get behind those people and let them be the face of certain movements. Now, how many of those people would want to step forward? Because that takes, that takes a lot, you know, it comes with criticism and Mm -hmm. just a lot of attention and you can't really mess up where people then are like, I knew it was a sham. Like, you know, (laughs) they're like ready to get like the gotcha moment. But I think that we have to put people in position that represent marriage in a positive light but that are also able to kind of talk about the the difficult stuff too, because I think a lot of people, the danger is if you, you know, you just talk about the great things associated with marriage. What happens is when people then get into marriage and it's not all hunky dory, it's not all easy all the time. It's like, well, dang, maybe I chose the wrong person. Mm -hmm. Not that, well, marriage is just difficult. Marriage requires you to work on these different skills and to, you know, evolve in these different ways. So I think that we need to have more honest conversations about the benefits of marriage. One, because I think a lot of men perceive it as there are all of these potential pitfalls if it doesn't work out, not focusing on what are the possible benefits that could arise if it works out. Or Mm -hmm. even if it doesn't work out, what are some of the benefits that could offset that because with any situation that doesn't work out, yes, there were there were some cons, but there were also probably some pros. Like when you think about your first marriage, there were some things that probably went really, really bad, really wrong. But there were some things probably that you gained as well from those experiences. Mm-hmm. So I think if we're more honest about that, because, yeah, men will tell you, you know, if it doesn't work out for me, then there's, I, I'm going to have to pay alimony. If there's children, I'm going to have to pay child support. And then I'm going to have to do this, this, and this. And that's going to put me in a, a worse situation. I risk giving up half of what I've, what I've gained and all these other yeah. things. Yeah. And then, but you don't talk about, well, what are the positive things that might've come out of that, even if it doesn't work out? And so I think if we have more married men come forward and talk to the boys and the men, Because I think you had to start talking to them when they're like teenagers. Yeah. And because that's when those thoughts start first coming in about sowing your wild oats and, Mm -hmm. you know, playing the field and glorifying being with multiple women. I think that starts then. Mm -hmm. And then I think we have to have some representation that we have chosen that we can say like this, these couples, they speak for us Mm. and like they're good representations of marriage. And even if the marriage doesn't work out between those two, they exemplify what healthy marriage looks like, even if it doesn't work out. Mm, I like that. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think, do you think we're past that day where say we had leaders who spoke for us? Are we past that? Like we had Mondo the King, we had Malcolm X, mm-hmm. we had Marcus Garvey, we had all these different people, right? But in 2022, it, is that attainable is that something that we still want or i think most people don't want it and i think that's part of the problem i was talking to alan about this after in our like recap conversation of that mm-hmm. live mm-hmm. and i was telling him that um i think that there are again it's a lot more communication happening so it's easy for somebody to start a podcast to get on live on instagram or on youtube and just start spewing out all these opinions Mm -hmm. i think the people but unfortunately then you also have people like in the comment section of youtube videos that are calling women all kind of b words and all kind of other stuff because they don't agree with what they're saying Mm -hmm. i think 
we have to come to a consensus and say, okay, this is what we want for our culture and our people. We want more healthy black marriages. If we say that that's an objective that we have, everybody has to get on board and agree to be quiet if they are not a good representation mm. of the movement. And so I think mm. that's the thing that's sort of missing is like everybody wants, and yes, your opinion is important, but it may not be important for this conversation. Mm. And I think that that's something that people have to come to terms with within themselves that yet, yes, my, I am important. My opinion is valuable, but it's not valuable in this conversation because I am on board with what our community has set for the objective, which is to get people married. So if I'm saying something that is in opposition to that, I need to keep that to myself because the goal of the whole is bigger than my individual opinions. Mm. And I think that's what would make that difficult to do. But I think the same way that that worked back then with getting people that were in position to represent us, it worked. Mm -hmm. Like say what, anybody can say what they wanna say. The civil rights movement, we still haven't seen anything like that since, especially within the black community. But that was a different type of unity back then. And I think that speaks to the hopelessness that we felt in that situation. So I think until we fully feel that this is not working and that it's costing us, not just, oh, it's costing women or it's costing men, Mm -hmm. it's costing us as a collective and as a community, that's when people come forward and say, okay, something has to change because we're struggling out here. Mm -hmm. Not just the women are struggling, but as a community, we are struggling. Our children are struggling as a result of this. Our legacies are struggling as a result of this. And so maybe this is a better alternative. We can at least give this a try. Mm. (laughs) It's good. (laughs) That would be beautiful. It'd be tough, but. You know, if we, if we, if we came together that, yeah, we would, we would really make some changes. Um, I do think the, the problem is, um, I ask people this all the time. Does what you look at in your social media stream align with what goes on up here? Like, Mm -hmm. what is your belief system? Do you really believe healthy marriages? Because me personally, I believe you are what you scroll. You are what you, because, um, and hear me when I say this, we're all like little gods, right? In our phone, we're all like Mm -hmm. little gods. And what I mean by that is we cater social media caters to us what we what we look at mm-hmm. so if we're watching and no shades and no tv shows but if you're watching certain tv shows or you listen to certain kind of music it, it caters to your stream so mm-hmm. what's in my phone and what's in my neighbor's phone are two totally different worlds oh um, yeah you see what i'm saying Oh, yeah. I had this conversation with and I was like joking when I was saying, but it's true, Mm -hmm. especially on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And I think YouTube as well. Instagram is, you know, they be doing some weird stuff with their algorithm. But like TikTok and TikTok and YouTube, TikTok for sure, Mm -hmm. their algorithm will reveal to you who you are. Mm -hmm. Because like literally I was telling my mom when I go on TikTok, I literally see proposal videos people talking about like relationship related content. Like I see people like doing gym, like the gym talk people. And that's pretty much it. Like it's, it's pretty consistent, but it's in alignment with the things that I have taken interest in. And so I think that that is definitely true. If you look at what content is even shown to you, that says a lot about mentally what you're entertaining because if you spend time on the app the algorithms do a pretty good job of showing you content that that you're interested in have you have you been on facebook and you're talking about something and then it pops up in your on your screen uh-huh. and you're like big brother's watching for real huh yeah like i was just talking about getting <laughs> pots and pans and then something hex clad or something comes up and it's like oh okay well. <laughs> yeah right so that's you know those are things so i always tell people a lot of times it's not even what we even believe anymore it's what the algorithm is what we scroll and what we look at 
So what we believe doesn't even make a difference. It's just based on what we consume. Yeah. And that's what I think a lot of people are not putting enough stock into or giving that enough weight. We are highly impacted by what we see. And even the most independent thinker, they're going to be impacted in some way. And that's not to say that you're just going to adopt all of the thoughts and opinions of anything that you see, but it's going to shape how you think. Because now if you are a person that does take in and consider new information, Mm -hmm. you have to now consider this new information in the grand scheme of what you previously thought to be true. So even if you don't fully adopt it, you're able to now use that as consideration to either support or, you know, maybe deny or question what you previously thought. It still has an impact on you regardless. Yes, yes. I think the biggest thing, and again, I'm equal opportunity. I I get it, you know, you want to do ratchet stuff with your friends, I get it. But just balance that out with good stuff. Give people, at least give people the option. Mm -hmm. Don't just shove reality TV down my throat and there not be any options. Yeah. Yeah, like I think balance is good, Mm -hmm. you know, just for, and that again, it's kind of balancing the greater good of the collective over your own individual desires. So whatever you if if you want to take the approach of criticism about what's happening within our community and what you're seeing then you need to take some responsibility in helping to change that i think there's a lot of people that want to be a part of the problem but not the solution and just pointing out problems does not in itself bring about solutions because mm, people and, and want especially if you're still doing the same thing that you've been doing that's contributing to the problem <laughs> yeah right <laughs> one thing i learned about people is people will complain and don't come up with a solution they just they just like to complain oh yeah and if you ask about solutions crickets yep you'll be surprised how many dms i get about why relationships aren't healthy and I'm just like, you don't watch the content. I'm not <laughs> saying to put me on a pedestal, but I'm just like, yeah. I've dropped almost 300 videos. And how could mm-hmm. you say there's no healthy, you know, and I put myself out there. Like, I don't mind. I'm very transparent about my personal life. Mm-hmm. I tell people about my failures, you know what I'm saying? From my first marriage, shoot, to today. Even, mm-hmm. you know, where I go wrong with my wife. And that, like, I'm at an age now where I just, I don't care. Like... I've, I've been through worse yeah so yeah and a lot of people just aren't equipped to even take that on you know for various reasons but it's it's a lot yes <laughs> well having conversations like this you know this can help some people along the way so you just never know sometimes it just takes each one to teach one you know yeah it could be like a slow burn gradually yeah and i mean that was a conversation that i had with um alan as well just because um with these types of conversations where you do have people like you're saying who they have a lot of criticism or a lot of just thoughts uninformed thoughts but thoughts nonetheless (laughs) Uh, when you're in a space like that sometimes it can feel like we're not moving the the needle at all Mm -hmm. like progress might be happening like and I'm sure you probably get comments as well or messages from people like thank you that resonated with me or whatever like that shifted my perspective something positive but a lot of times we attach we attach our success to those things and we have to acknowledge the fact that there are going to be a lot of people that are impacted by things that we do that are never going to say a word and Mm -hmm. I think when we think about even with reviews for a restaurant, most times there's a certain person that leaves a review. Either they were very highly satisfied or very dissatisfied. You don't get comments from people that were like, oh, I went into Chick-fil-A today and it was cool. Like it was as expected. Those people don't leave comments. They don't leave reviews about the product. So the same is true with this type of content and these conversations where the vast majority of people might experience a transformation. They may experience a shift in perspective, but it may not necessarily move them enough to tell anybody about it. And so a lot of the work that in this space, when it happens, it is changing people's lives, but you'll just never really know the full extent to which it has impacted people. So like we have to move away from the result 
and seeing people tell us how we're doing and just know that, okay, this is an assignment that I've been given. I've been called to do this. And the fact that good or bad, the fact that people say anything to you shows influence. Mm. Mm, I love that. I agree. I, I, I agree. I think, yeah, I think sometimes it's good. And I've learned this over the years is that, uh, cause I've rebranded like well, mm. I was doing this my first time around, mm. you know what I'm saying? So I rebranded, I had to do this thing all over and stuff. There's a, a whole story behind it. Yeah. But, um, uh, um, what was I about to say? Uh, oh, about comments. I make it my business personally to leave comments um, or leave a review or rate somebody's podcast or things of that nature because you just never know somebody's one comment away from giving yep. up. Yep. You know, and just, and and I'll keep it real too. I'll be like, well, maybe you can use a little help here or there. You know what I'm saying? But I'll be like, hey, great shows, you know, be encouraged, something like yeah. that. Yeah. But yeah. you just never know, because some people they 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 wouldn't have thrown in a towel. You just never know. Mm-hmm. That's so important. It is. It's good that you do that, because a lot of people don't. I've started adopting that too, and I, I just urge people to do that even in their personal lives, because a lot of times, even we'll have friends or something who are doing good things, mm-hmm. and or people on social media that are doing good things, but and we assume they already know. We assume that there are other people telling them you're doing a good job. And that might not be the case. Or maybe your comment hit different than everybody else's. And so like, I experienced that even with me, like people will send me messages and then when I respond, they're shocked that I responded. And I'm just like, well, I appreciate that you took the time out to say something to me. So yeah, I'm gonna respond, you know? So it it really does, it really can. like maybe there are some people who like they get so many yeah. comments and praise and things like that that they just it's like okay okay i get it mm-hmm. but like for the vast majority of average people hearing that helps so like anybody listening if you have somebody that you acknowledge is doing good things tell them even if you think they know yeah because what it sets you apart from everybody else is what you do because uh, it's easy to double tap on instagram it is but to comment is it's different different. yeah it hits different right yeah i'm just like my whole thing especially with doing this and realizing how important that is just to to not only double tap but comment leave a comment on youtube even with you right i was like i was like she got bars i gotta just say (laughs) something you know what i'm saying because i wouldn't want you to get lost in the turn of oh nobody's Mm -hmm you know what i'm saying and then we lose a great voice in the process of well nobody's paying attention anyway see what i'm saying yeah and i'm gonna be honest i think that's important too especially when you're in spaces that are controversial because it can be really easy if you lose if you lose sight of again like what the assignment is that you were here to accomplish it can be very easy to get bogged down by any negative comments so it's like, if, especially if you have multiple of them, those positive comments make a difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, oh my God. Yeah. I have so many people coming for me. It's ridiculous. <laughs> real. Like if you, if you go through my stuff and you see the comment, oh, he's a simp. He married some chick he met on Instagram. They, yeah. You know, they just, get angry. Yeah. Right. I just did. I did a whole video on it. I was like, I'm just going to do a whole video on me being a simp. And basically it was more of like, but I'm in love. I'm happily married. Aww. You know what I'm saying? Those kind of things. But people, they come for you in the comment section, especially if you get a video that gets a lot of traction. It's going to come. It's going, it's not even an if it's, it's going to come. And to me, it's like just validation and confirmation that That's what you're supposed to be doing. Like there is literally no influential person that only gets positive comments Yeah. at all. Because if everybody agrees with you, there's no need for you. Like you're not, people are not (laughs) gonna share your videos. They're not gonna, people share stuff that like hits them in Mm -hmm. some way. Like it kind of shook the table a little bit. It might've offended you a little bit. Like that's what people share and that's what people talk about. So you got, and that's not to say like just start saying crazy stuff to get reaction from people but you know it's it's all you have to take everything in stride 
Yeah, that's true. What, what Jesus says, beware when all men speak well of you. Yeah, something's not something's not right. Because how are you catering to everybody's opinions? Like, how how would that even be possible? Mm-hmm. It doesn't even make sense. Yeah, right. I'm I'm all for my audience is for people who want to love again after heartbreak, especially going through a divorce. If you want to do this again, I can help you. But I'm I'm not for everybody. If you got the the cold heart. Or if you threw with marriage or you threw with with women or you threw with men, like that's not my my audience. Yeah. And I think there's so much truth to like the misery loves company thing. People will like they want you to feel how they feel. I don't think I've given enough credit to the fact that um, and I keep saying men because men are predominantly who watches Alan's channel. And so I've seen a lot of their comments. But like, I I don't think I gave enough credit to the fact that there are a lot of men that are out hurting. Like they have been hurt. They have felt overlooked. They have felt undervalued. They feel like women don't see them. I don't think I put enough credit to that part, like how many of those men there are out there. And so I talk about them getting upset a lot in the comments and I understand it to an extent because they're only seeing their experiences. Yep. So if you say anything that is in opposition to that, I think they get defensive and they are like that to them is you invalidating their experience. Mm-hmm. And your experience is your experience. That doesn't mean that that is even representative of the majority. That is your experience. So I think that it helps potentially to have a little bit more compassion for those gentlemen because they're clearly hurt because there is that is the only way that you can come out so hot on certain topics that literally are not talking to you. Like nobody is talking to you directly, Jerome, like in the comments, like nobody, nobody said your name in the con- like at all, but you took that personally because it, it, it pertained to you in some way that yep. you fit in some manner. Yep. And Jerome don't even have an avatar. Jerome has no face. He has no videos. He's been on on YouTube since 2017. But like, and he watches every video. Is everybody a member of everybody's channel? Yeah. Comment throughout the entire premiere of the video. But you know, but I don't know Jerome, and he does not know me. We will probably never be in conversation directly with one another. But that's the other thing too. That's why I'm about to start doing that. Mm-hmm. like a live type format show where people can actually come up and speak to me yeah. like mm-hmm. in the, the midst of a live stream mm-hmm. because I do think when you're behind a keyboard your demeanor is a bit different than if the requirement is you're going to come up you're going to actually speak to me you're going to come up on camera and talk to me and say what you whatever you you're wanting to say about this topic I think that um anonymity that Mm -hmm. the internet provides behind a keyboard is also a bit detrimental to these conversations Mm -hmm. yeah because it's easy to be thumb thugging you know on your phone you be talking smack on your phone you know you meet somebody in person it's a different ball game you know they come and shake your hand they meet you in person they're like i loved all your content and come to find out that's jerome without the (laughs) avatar jerome that was jerome in person that's the thing. It's like, I think too, like, 